So let me ask you today, have you ever needed a second chance? Was there ever a time in your life where you needed a second opportunity? Maybe, maybe you were playing golf and your first shot was terrible and you took a mulligan on the first hole. Maybe you took a mulligan on every hole. I'm not exactly sure, huh? Maybe you took a test and you failed the test and you needed to retake the test and you were so relieved when the professor or the teacher allowed you to retake the test. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, your employer had a forgiving spirit. Maybe you did something that you shouldn't have done at work and, man, you thought for sure that your job was in jeopardy and you were going to lose your job, but your employer had a forgiving spirit and gave you a second chance. Maybe you had a relationship that was on the rocks and maybe you blew it and uh, your spouse allowed you to come back and has given you a second chance chance. Or maybe, maybe your first marriage was a disaster and you have a second shot. God's uh, introduced you to somebody else who you love and, uh, and uh, you can have this Christ-honoring relationship and you have a second chance at marriage. Without a doubt, all of us have experienced times in our life when we needed another opportunity. Because of our humanity, we tend to blow it. I blow it on a regular basis. There's times that I don't respond correctly. There's times that I say things that I shouldn't. There's times that maybe I lose my temper and I have to go back and apologize to an individual and say, man, I'm sorry, I blew it. Would you give me a second chance? When that happens, you and I need for someone to demonstrate mercy and graciousness to us. Today's passage is a clear illustration of God's tender mercy and God's patience with his prophet. And not only God's patience with Jonah, but we're going to see God demonstrating his patience with the people, the wicked, rebellious people of Nineveh. And so I want you to see that I don't think I apologize. I don't think our screens are working today. I'm not exactly what, sure what's the problem, but uh, but. Uh, Uh, Turn on your phones, turn on your iPad, take your Bible if you have it with you, and follow me as we read Jonah chapter 3. We're going to read the first 10 verses. If you don't have a device that you can look at, um, uh, I'm going to read it slowly so you can catch. Jonah chapter 3 and verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. If you have a Bible and you underline, that's a great phrase to underline. The word of God came to Jonah a second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going to day's journey, and called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. It will be destroyed. Notice this phrase, And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word of their response reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and he, the king, sat in ashes, a demonstration of repentance. And he issued a proclamation and published it throughout Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. I love verse 10. When God saw what they did, when God saw how the Ninevites responded, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster. God relented of the destruction that he had said that he would do to them, and he did not do it. Would you pray with me today? Lord, I pray that you would help us to see a Um, a few practical truths from this passage. Help us to see that that just as Jonah was given a second chance, you desire to give us a second chance. Help us to respond to you like Jonah did, like the Ninevites did. God, I pray that you would do in our city, in our community, 
what you did in the city of Nineveh. God, we are asking and praying for a mighty work of God in our community, and we're trusting you for it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let me just review real quick. You know the story. Jonah was commanded to take a message to the Ninevites. And instead of going to the Ninevites, he fled in the opposite direction. We saw that. Instead of going right, he went left. Instead of going east, he went west. And he went a long ways from where God wanted him to go. As a result, God sent a storm to get a hold of Jonah's attention. And and you remember the story. So Jonah was thrown overboard, and God had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Brad indicated in his message last week that Jonah may have died in the belly of the fish and was miraculously resurrected after three days, giving us a beautiful picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, so, so whether Jonah died in the belly of the fish or whether he survived, we see that God induces the fish to discharge its unusual cargo. That's just a nice way to say that the fish spit up Jonah on the shore. He vomited Jonah up on the shore. So now that Jonah was back on dry land, that, that, that experience, that memorable experience that he had is now in the past. How would Jonah respond? Would he now turn and run from God like he ran from him before? Was this decision to surrender to God, to do what God wanted, was that simply a foxhole decision or a whale's belly decision, as it says in the passage? Or would Jonah fulfill his commitment to the Lord? This is such a great story. Let me give you a, just a few practical truths that, that we can chew on, not only today, but throughout the week. The first thing that I wrote in my notes that we see is this, God often gives us a second chance. Amen, church? God often, he doesn't always, he's not obligated to, but God often gives us a second chance. He did that for Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And God, God brings, he gives Jonah the exact same command that he had given him the first time. He gives Jonah a second chance to fulfill his will. It's Pastor George Morrison that made the statement, the Christian life is a series of new beginnings. Is it not? We, we blow it. We ask for forgiveness, and God gives us another opportunity. We blow it. We ask for forgiveness, and God gives us another opportunity We're so grateful today for the grace of God. When we fall, the enemy wants us to believe that our ministry is over. The enemy wants us to believe that there is no hope for recovery. But God is a God of second chances. It's his character. He not only gave a second chance to Jonah, but he's given second chances to me, and I'm confident that he's giving and desires to give a second chance to you. Think with me today of all the individuals in the Bible who were given a second opportunity. Abraham, in reality, failed to believe God. And when he took Hagar and his wife and he had that first son that was Ishmael, that wasn't God's choice, Abraham said, okay, that's it, God, I'm satisfied. And God said, no, Ishmael is not the son of promise. I'm going to give you a second son. I'm going to give you a second opportunity. And Isaac was born. Moses killed a man in the Egyptian desert and thought that he was disqualified. He ran to Midian and he thought that his life and his ministry was over. But God had a plan for Moses and he gave Moses a second chance. David was forgiven after his affair with Bathsheba. And you and I are able to even read in Scripture the inspired words of God written by David in the Psalms telling us the, the struggles and the, and the forgiveness that David received with the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar was given a second chance. If you know the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar went, and man, he, uh, he, uh, he proclaimed himself to be God, basically, and God struck him down. And for several years, he lived like an animal until God raised him up and gave Nebuchadnezzar a second chance. Peter, after denying the Lord three times, was powerfully used by God in the book of Acts. Here's what I'm saying. God gives second chances. 
And we find that truth powerfully illustrated in the life of Jonah. After disobeying God's direct command and after running in the opposite direction, God gives Jonah a second opportunity. Let me just pause for a second and say, that is what mercy and grace are all about. And here's what I want you to catch today. If God gave Jonah a second chance, don't you think that God would like to do the same thing for you? Maybe you're here today and you feel like God's placed you on a shelf. Maybe you're here today and there was a period in your life where you were closer to the Lord. Maybe you were more active in the work of God and and for some reason, maybe you ran, maybe you've just gotten cold, maybe you've disconnected, and for some reason you might be here today wondering, can God use me again? Can I be of any service to the Lord? My challenge to you is this, remember Abraham. Remember David, remember Peter, and remember Jonah. God still desires to use you. So the book begins, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. As you've already seen as we read through the chapter, this time Jonah responds differently. Instead of running down through Joppa and into Tarsus, we find that Jonah rose. Verse 3 tells us that Jonah rose, he got up, God gave him the command, and he went to Nineveh. I love this phrase, according to the word of the Lord. In other words, Jonah had made a decision that now he was going to do what God wanted him to do. Verse 3 tells us that Nineveh was an exceedingly large city. Archaeologists have confirmed that, by the way. They found the city of Nineveh, and they found that it is an extremely large um, city. Recently, archaeologists have come to conclude that Nineveh was actually a complex of four ancient cities. And by the way, you can see that in Genesis chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. These four cities were set up in a square, and to go around these cities would be to cover a distance of some 60 miles. They say that there was a 100-foot wall surrounding those cities, and the wall was wide enough to drive three chariots on. This was an exceedingly large city. The text simply says it this way, that it was a three days journey. The ESV describes it saying it was a three days journey in breadth. What does that mean? Some say that it means it took three days to walk from one end of the city to the other. Others say that it took three days to go to all of the public places to make uh, a proclamation. Most believe that there were some 400 to 500,000 people that lived in the city of Nineveh. So, So here's Jonah obeying what God wants him to do, shows up at the largest, if not one of the largest cities in the world, and yet one of the most wicked cities in the world. One, one writer said it this way. I loved it. I actually took what he said. He said, after being spit out by a fish, Jonah hops on a camel and travels a month through the desert. When he arrives at Nineveh, he gets off of the camel and gives the most effective evangelistic message in the history of the world. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? At the end of his message, some 300 to 500,000 people believe in God. Peter never had a sermon like that. Jesus never had a sermon like that. Brian's never had a sermon like that. Jonah preaches, and it says that the entire city believed in God. That's surprising to me because Jonah's message was unique. That there were no funny stories. The, there were no object lessons. I know everybody likes it when we do an object lesson and when you tell a funny story. Jonah's message had no funny stories. There, the, there were no object lessons. There wasn't even an outline that you could follow. The, there was no screens that put the passage of Scripture up. As a matter of fact, Jonah's message contained only eight words. Eight words was his message. Yet 40 days and the city of Nineveh will be overthrown. Forty days, and the city of Nineveh will be destroyed. In English, eight words. In Hebrew, it's only five words. So here's Jonah, God's reluctant prophet, 
shows up at the most wicked city probably on the planet at that time and preaches a five in Hebrew and eight in English word message simply saying, in 40 days, your city is going to be destroyed. It's interesting, there's no call to repentance There's no teaching about God or or teaching about who God is or what God even wanted them to do. There's no conditional offers of forgiveness that's found in this message. There's no deep theological teaching. He simply stood up and gave the simple message that God told him to give. How would the Ninevites respond? Well, as we've seen in the passage, the entire city believed in God. The second thing that I wrote in my notes, because this is a demonstration of that, is that God is gracious and compassionate. I want you to catch this because Jonah chapter 3 is not about the Ninevites. Jonah chapter 3 is not about, boy, the response of these Ninevites, how they repented, and we'll see that in just a moment, and turned to God. No, Jonah chapter 3 is not about them. Jonah chapter 3 is about God. Jonah chapter 3 is about God's grace. It's about God's mercy, and it's about God's compassion for a wicked, rebellious people that deserve to be destroyed. Two things happened which demonstrated God's graciousness. If you're following along in your outline, the first thing is this, the Ninevites repented. The Ninevites repented. There are two phrases which demonstrate their repentance. The first is found in verse 5, just a very simple phrase after Jonah preached his message. The phrase simply says this, they believed God. The people of Nineveh believed God. It's interesting, most Bible commentators hold that Nineveh immediately responded to the message. So so, so I ask myself the question, why would these Ninevites, who were incredibly wicked, who were incredibly cruel, who who no doubt were incredibly anti-Jehovah God, they probably had their own God, why in the world would they listen to this foreigner who comes, shows up in their city, and preaches an eight-word message? Why would they respond to that message? I came to two conclusions. I didn't put them in your notes, but you might want to write them down. The first is the testimony of Jonah. The testimony of Jonah. Let me ask you, do you know of anybody who has a more powerful testimony than Jonah? (laughs) I don't know of anybody who has a more powerful testimony than Jonah. Here's a guy who was eaten by a fish, who was taken to the grave, who was brought back again. Some commentators say that Jonah's skin was probably still bleached white from the gastric juices from being in the fish's belly. Luke tells us in Luke chapter 11, he simply makes this statement. He says, Jonah was a sign to the people of Nineveh. He doesn't describe what he means. He simply says, Jonah was a sign to the people of Nineveh. Here's what he was, church. I want you to catch this. He was a living demonstration of the power of God. Jonah was a living demonstration of the power of God. His testimony, no doubt they had heard. Most believe that the story of Jonah had already gotten to Nineveh before him. It preceded him getting there. They had heard his story. Jonah's testimony was extremely powerful. Let me pause for a second and make this application to you. Just as Jonah's testimony was extremely powerful, so your testimony is extremely powerful. You might sit back and say, Okay, Brian, never been eaten by a fish, (laughs) never been vomited by a fish, all right? Never never smelt like whale gastric juices before, all right? I don't have the drama in my testimony that Jonah had. Listen, I I can assure you that your testimony is powerful because if you know Jesus Christ, you have been raised from death to life. If you know Jesus Christ, he has taken your sinful life and he has transformed it by the power of the gospel. Your story, like Jonah's, is powerful. And so it was the testimony of Jonah that caused the Ninevites to believe. But the second thing is this, the grace 
of God. The grace of God, you see, God in his grace and his mercy allowed the Ninevites to see their sin and allowed the Ninevites to respond to his kindness. No one comes to God unless they're drawn by the Holy Spirit of God. And so here we find Jonah standing up preaching this simple message, not expecting anything to happen. And God in his grace does a work in the hearts of the Ninevites and he breaks their hearts and they and he causes them to believe in him <laughs> it's a demonstration of God's grace it's a demonstration of God's mercy we could sit back and say boy those Ninevites they certainly didn't deserve to be saved <laughs> man neither do you and neither do I any person who is able to believe in God is a demonstration of the grace of God. Let me, let me just quote three verses. I wanted to put them up on the screen. Numbers, Numbers 14, 18, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. Psalm 86, 15, but you, O Lord, are merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and graciousness. I love this one, Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Oh, do you presume on the riches and kindness and forbearance and patience of God, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead to repentance? Isn't that a great description of what took place in Nineveh? It was God's kindness that led them to repentance. Did they deserve to be forgiven? No. Did they deserve to be destroyed? Yes. Did they deserve God's kindness? No. But it was God's kindness towards them that led them to repentance. Here's the bottom line. When Jonah proclaimed God's pending judgment, the Ninevites not only heard the message, but they believed God. And as a result of believing God, they demonstrated repentance. If, if you're walking through the passage, verses 5 through 9, are a demonstration of the repentance of the Ninevites. How did they demonstrate repentance? First of all, by not eating. So you might say, okay, Brian, if I don't eat today, is that a demonstration of repentance? Not necessarily in your case. It means that they were fasting. It means, that, here's what they wanted to do. They wanted to show God that they were serious. They wanted to show God that they were serious about believing in him. And a fast was proclaimed throughout the entire city. I love the command of the king because the king not only commands all of the people to fast, but he says, I don't want anybody to eat. I don't want any of the people to eat. And by the way, I don't want any of the herds and the flocks and the beasts. Nobody is going to eat. What are we going to do? We're going to demonstrate to God that we are serious. The second thing they did is they dressed in burlap. The, the, putting on burlap had the idea of, a, or, or, or in the text that talks about wearing sackcloth, it, 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 it was uncomfortable clothing that basically, I'm not going to describe it, but it was uncomfortable clothing that demonstrated that somebody was in mourning. Very similar to us wearing black today for a funeral. We wear black, we demonstrate what? We're demonstrating the fact that we are grieving. We demonstrate the fact that we are in mourning. To put on sackcloth was a demonstration that they were grieving over their sin, that they were mourning over their sin. It was a sign of deep repentance. It was a sign of humility. Ashes were often included as a further symbol of personal abhorrence and chagrin. So here's what they did. They believed God and they repented. Hey, let me pause for a second because I want you to catch that. It's so important for us. Here's what repentance is. Repentance is a change of mind which results in a change of heart, which results in a change of action. Do, do you catch that? Repentance is a change of mind. So, so here's what it means. I used to see sin this way. The things that I do that, that didn't please God, that used to not bother me, it didn't, I wasn't bothered by it, but now that I'm a Christian, I see that my sin offends God. And so my opinion of my sin changes. There is a change of mind which results in a change of heart, which then results what? In a change of action. We see that in the passage that the Ninevites repented of their evil ways. 
And you might say, Brian, how do we know they really repented? We actually had a conversation about that this week as we discussed the passage. How do we know that they really repented? And we'll see in just a few moments how we know that they repented. But let me, let me ask you a question today. Have you repented of your sin? You see, there's a tendency, if I can be blatantly honest today, there, there's a tendency in Christian circles to say, no, I believe, but I still can embrace my sin. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but there's certain things that I do that I know the Lord doesn't like, but, but you know what? I, I, I'm not going to change. And to be honest with you, to become a follower of Christ, repentance is necessary. It doesn't mean that we change overnight. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden from one day to another, man, we're this bad person and now we're goody two-shoes, but it means that our mind, our opinion of sin completely changes. We realize that what we were doing offends a holy and a righteous God and my mind has changed. I view that sin completely different. That change of mind will result through the power of the Holy Spirit, a change of hearts, and will result in a change of action. That's why we often define repentance as turning and going the other way. It's not turning and going the way. It's a change of mind, but that change of mind will result eventually in a change of action. So let me ask you today, have you repented? Is there, is there something in your life for which you have not repented? You realize that God is offended by what you are doing, but for some reason you still hold on to that, and you hold on to it tightly, and you do not want to let it go. Here's what God wants. God wants for there to be a change of mind in your life that will result in a change in your heart that will eventually produce a change of action. That's what happened with the Ninevites. There's a second thing that we see. The Ninevites repented, but the second thing in the passage that I love is God relented. God relented. We'll define that word in just a few moments. So I asked the question just a few moments ago, how do we know that the Ninevites really repented? And by the way, um, that's an important question because 100 years later, if you study ancient Near Eastern history, 100 years later, Nineveh is once again an extremely wicked city. And the prophet Nahum comes and he preaches pretty much the same message against Nineveh that Jonah preached. Nineveh doesn't repent, and Nineveh is destroyed by God 100 years later. But how do we know in this case that the Ninevites heard Jonah's message and responded. I mean, the text says they believed, and it shows that they repented, but how do we know? Notice verse 10, it's because the, the text tells us. In verse 10, it says, when God saw what they did, when God saw how they turned from their evil ways, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them. Here's what took place. God saw their change of heart. What a beautiful, perfect illustration of the omniscient awareness of God. Catch that, church. God knows everything. There is nothing that happens outside of his consciousness he knows everything. He not only saw how the, how the Ninevites repented, but he saw their heart. He saw their works. He saw that they had turned from their evil. God sees what we do. You and I cannot hide anything from God. As a, regard, as a result of God seeing their repentance, the text says that God relented. You, you're... Your translation might say it differently. Your translation might say that God repented. I'm not, I'm not crazy about that word in the passage because the, the idea isn't that God had a change of mind. The idea isn't that he wasn't caught by surprise. He wasn't up in heaven going, oh my word, I can't believe that the Ninevites actually responded to the message. And God the Father looks at God the Son and says, I think we're going to have to forgive them. And God repented of the disaster. That's not the idea that is being conveyed in the passage. God was not caught by surprise. He didn't suddenly have a change of mind. 
The idea in the passage is simply this, that God responded to the repentant attitude of the Ninevites. When they repented, he responded. (coughs) What a blessing to know that when we repent, God responds. When you have a broken heart before God and you grieve for something that you have done that has grieved the Holy Spirit of God and you repent of that, God sees that. God is aware of that. God is conscious of that. And God responds. I sat back in my notes and once again wrote this question. Aren't you glad that God doesn't give us what we deserve? Amen? Aren't you glad that God doesn't give us what we deserve? He has graciously demonstrated his mercy and his grace to all of us. As I mentioned, Nineveh's repentance wouldn't be long-lived. Within 100 years, they would once again turn away from God. God would send Nahum. He would pronounce destruction, and the city of Nineveh would be destroyed. But the simple truth is this. In this passage, God demonstrates grace and mercy. He demonstrated it to Jonah, and he demonstrated it to the Ninevites. Here's the third thing that I want you to see, and let me hit this quickly because we want to take the Lord's Supper today. The third thing that we see is this. God can transform any city. I really want you to see this, church. God can transform any city. I would remind you that Nineveh was one of, if not the most wicked city and violent city in the world. If any city would have been characterized as untransformable, it would have been the city of Nineveh. If anybody would have looked and said, man, there's a city that even God can't change, it would have been the city of Nineveh. Yet as we read the story, we find something miraculous, something supernatural that happens. In Nineveh, God's power overcame their wickedness or their power. His holiness overcame their wickedness, and God's grace overcame their cruelty. Isn't it ironic that God shows kindness to the most unkind city on the planet? God shows grace to the most ungracious city in the world during that time, One of the most powerful cities, God comes in and demonstrates his power, not by physical force, not by physical might, but God comes in and demonstrates his power by his spiritual force and his spiritual might. And he transforms the city of Nineveh by himself doing a work of God in that city. And he completely transforms it from the king all the way down to every single person. Now, I say that for a reason today. I say that because just as Nineveh needed to be transformed, our community in South Florida needs to be transformed. Do you agree with me when I make that statement? We live in a wonderful place. We live in one of the most beautiful places, I think, on the planet. We live in a place that even when it rains, it's beautiful, right? We, we live in a place that it never snows. We live in a place that, Mark, you know our son Mark's pastoring up in Wisconsin, and so every Sunday we go home and we ask him, how did church go? And we went home last Sunday and asked him, Mark, how did church go? He said, Dad, we had the worst snowstorm of the year. April 15th, they're still having a snowstorm up in Wisconsin. I asked him, I said, don't you want to come back down to South Florida? We'll, we'll find a job for you, you know, doing something, you know. Sweep in the parking lot or something like that. We'll find a job for you. He wanted to stay up there. Listen, we live in a beautiful, beautiful place. But we live in a place that desperately needs transformation. We live in a place that desperately needs Jesus. Can I give you just a couple of statistics today? Oh, shoot, I was going to put them up on the screen. I can't put them up on the screen. Oh, man. So so let me give these to you today. Kind of let these sink in. Only 3% of Broward County, 3% of the people in our community meet the basic criteria of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. 
That's not my conclusions. That's George Barna, who, who made the, 3% of South Florida meets the criteria to be a follower of Jesus Christ. The number of de-churched in our community, the number of people who used to attend church and no longer attend church is double that of the national average. So there are two times as many people in South Florida that used to attend church than there are in the rest of the country. The number of those who have never attended church in South Florida is three times that of the national average. Here's what I'm telling you, church. We live on the mission field. You go to work on the mission field. Your, your community is the mission field. God has placed us in an ideal place to be salt and light, as Stephen said, and to be living representatives of Jesus Christ. Al Mohler, who's the president of Southern Seminary, said this, as California was the great evangelical laboratory of the last generation, Florida is the great ministry laboratory right now. And Al Mohler says this, watch what God is doing in Florida. Watch what God is going to do in Florida. Church, here's what I want you to catch. We live on the mission field. We live on the front lines. We live in Nineveh. We live in a place that desperately needs Jesus Christ. And just as God did a great work in Nineveh, I am convinced today, I am convicted today that God desires to do a great work in South Florida. So, so how can that happen? How can that happen? Can I give you a couple of, of, uh, of simple things and my time's done? The first is this. City transformation requires surrender. City transformation requires surrender. You see, God's plan for transforming Nineveh was one surrendered prophet. God didn't sit back and say, okay, I need a huge evangelistic team of about 100 missionaries to go in this city. I need 10 church planners. I need 10 parachurch organizations. I need 10 worship leaders. I need all of this in order if we're going to reach Nineveh. No, God's plan was simple. Give me one prophet who was surrendered. Give me one prophet who would stand up and declare the message. And with that one prophet, God says, I have the power to transform a city. So when Jonah surrendered to the divine plan of God... God transformed the city of Nineveh. So here's my question today. Catch it. I know it's raining outside. I know it might be a little sticky in here. I know the screens aren't working, but I want you to catch this. If God used one man to reach a large city, what could God do with hundreds of people who are here today? What could God do with us? Someone made this statement, the world is yet to see what God can do through the life of a man or a woman who are completely sold out for God. You see, in order for us to transform our city, it's going to require surrender. Second Timothy says this, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So my question for you today is this, are you a useful vessel? Or are you a vessel that God cannot use? You see, city transformation requires surrender. City transformation requires unity. It requires unity. Hollywood Community Church will never transform our city alone. We have ministered independently far too long. We've been on this corner for 63 years. Taft Street down the road has been there for right at 60 years. Sheridan Hills, not far from us, has been there right at 60 years. We've worked independently for 60 years, and we're farther behind in reaching our community than we were 60 years ago. Here's what we need. We desperately need gospel unity. We need hundreds of churches united together for the sake of the gospel. That is the only way we're going to reach our community for Christ. The good news is that here in South Florida, God is uniting the church for the sake 
of the gospel. This past week, Jose and I spent two days in Naples, Florida with 30 other pastors across all kinds of different denominational lines in Naples, praying and asking God to give us a revival, asking God to do a transformative work in South Florida. You say, Brian, what does that mean? Hey, we're praying for several things. Obviously, we're praying for people to come to Christ, but we're praying to raise up leaders. We're praying to plant churches. We're praying to mobilize commerce. Yeah, yeah, what you do from Monday to Friday. We're praying to mobilize commerce for the kingdom of God. We're praying to engage education. We're trying to get in the public schools and make a difference in those schools and private schools. We're sitting back realizing we can't do it alone, but if we lock arms, there's no limit to what we can do together. God just could, God just could start a citywide gospel movement in South Florida if we would only join together. City transformation requires surrender, it requires unity, it requires prayer. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, God says, I will do a work and I will heal their city and I will heal their land. The last is this, city transformation gives God the glory. When Nineveh was transformed, who got the glory? Was it Jonah? It wasn't Jonah. It was God, and we'll see next week what Jonah did. (laughs) It wasn't Jonah who got the glory. It was God who got the glory. And when real city transformation occurs, it's God who gets the glory. Church, I I want you to catch this. God is the God of our city. You say, Brian, Hollywood is not the Bible Belt. Yes, God is the God of our city. And the same sovereign God who changed Nineveh can change South Florida. Stephen and his team are going to come. and <laughs> Stephen and his team are going to come, and they're going to lead us in this song. You're the God of this city. Listen to the words. We're going to sing it in just a moment. You're the God of this city. You're the king of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're a light in the darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. For greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Church, I believe with all of my heart, God wants to do a work in our city. God wants to transform it. Maybe not the way that we think. I think it's going to be untraditional. But God is working in our city. Let me ask you today, how does God want to use you to transform your city for the sake of the gospel? He can do it. Just maybe he's waiting for one prophet, for one person to say, okay, God, I'll do I'll be, I'll act how you want me to act. Would you stand with me today as we have a word of prayer? Maybe you're here today and there's never been a time in your life when you have repented of your sin. You have truly repented of your sin and you have turned by faith alone to Jesus Christ. I I would encourage you today to make that decision, to play it right where you are. Confess your sin. Cry out to God. Confess your sin and and reach out to Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you say, Brian, I desperately need a second chance. I desperately need it. Run to Jesus. He's the God of second chances. And how does God want to use you to reach our city? Doesn't mean you got to surrender to be a pastor. Where you are tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, God wants to use you there. And I don't mean take the biggest Bible you can and gather your coworkers together and stand up and preach hellfire and brimstone. Talking about being Jesus. Talking about about using what you do to to advance and enhance the kingdom of God. God desires to use you when you allow him to do it. Father, thank you so much for your grace and mercy. Thank you that you're a God of second chances. Thank you that you're a God that can transform the untransformable. You're a God who can change that which we view as unchangeable. And I pray right now that the Holy Spirit of God would do a work in our hearts. Make us usable. Help us to surrender to you. Examine our hearts, Lord, as we 
as we prepare to partake the Lord's Supper in just a few moments. May you be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.